Welcome back to the lab everyone. Today I've got an interesting video. I was kind of going through and I, I wanted to do more advanced videos and I kind of wanted to go over, you know, VDI and storage and a bunch of other things. And I realized, you know, there's one thing that I, I got to do before we can really move forward. And I got to cover the basics of a lot of this. I need to cover the basics of networking, the basics of virtualization, the basics of storage and, you know, sand upkeep and all that stuff. And I, I that's what I'm going to be doing over these probably next few weeks. You'll be seeing videos like this that will have, you know, the basics. So just get ready. I'm not going to put this little intro at the beginning of every one of them, but right now I've got this one. Just so you guys know that my next few videos, yes, I'm going to be making a bunch of basics videos that will be covering the basics of a bunch of different things so we can get onto those more advanced topics. So without further ado, let's jump on in. basics of networking all right guys so let's get started so I want to go ahead and I want to jump right in there's three things I want to just bring up real quick that I want to talk about during this video all right we're gonna start off with access points from there I'm gonna go about switches and then we'll go over to routers and the reason I want to go that way is because it's kind of how data flows you know you've got the access points way out at the end all right they're kind of controlling more of your internet of things and you got your switches that usually the access points are plugged into and then you've got all your other equipment and also internet of things sometimes plugged into it and then from there it goes into your routing so that's kind of be the plan of what this video is going to be about today. We're going to be starting at the very top, going from access points, working our way in to routers, and hopefully working our way out to the internet from there. So to start off, we've got access points. Access points or wireless access points, WAPs as you can call them, are a way you know for it, a lot of devices. I mean, a lot of us probably have. I got a cell phone sitting here. A lot of us have cell phones that are capable of connecting. A lot of us have tablets. A lot of us have e-readers. I mean, the list the list goes on, guys. It, that is capable of what is capable, I should say, of connecting to an access point. We've been using them now for, what, two decades we've had wireless almost now, I think? I'm not sure. As you can tell, I'm showing my age. I'm pretty young. So wireless has been a part of my, my life basically since the beginning, I'd say early 2000s, late 90s. So seems like 20 years that it's been going on. Um, but to go over what I was saying is wireless access points are basically a wireless switch. They allow us to connect all these different devices that are able to connect wirelessly and be able to route out and be able to search the internet, look up things, have people communicate, talk, be able to transmit data, and it's all done through thin air, and it's done by these things called a wireless access point. Sorry, The wireless access points are usually plugged into a switch, and even like some of the newer ones are provided what they are, what they call PoE, Power Over Ethernet. And what that means is that most wireless access points have a single Ethernet cord running to them. There's no power, there's no nothing, and all of the power is actually delivered right over that Ethernet cord. And a lot of those wireless access points, you're probably thinking, whoa, but doesn't that take a lot of power? No, you'd be surprised. I mean, some of the higher end ones that are outside can use 75, 95 watts, but I mean, most of the inside ones that are in hospitals and some of the small areas, you're looking at 15 to 35 watts a unit, which really isn't that bad and can easily be pushed over Cat5. And that's what's done a lot of times. So these wireless access points are then plugged into switches that are capable of powering them. Now, that's not always how it is, but that's how it is in an enterprise network. And then those switches are plugged into a router. And that router is what actually does the routing. So you can have all these different devices connected, but Who's going to tell it where to go? It's kind of kind of think of it as a traffic stop, right? You got this four-way stop here, but there's no traffic lights. There's no nothing, all right? All you got is one person standing in the middle with a bunch of you know lights trying to direct traffic. That's kind of what your router does. It sits there and it says, oh, this packet's from this person. Here's this packet, and it breaks down all this different data and it sends it to the proper destination. And sometimes it even takes in destinations and sends it back to you, so that way it knows where to go. And all of those systems together or what create your network. Now, to even make it more basic here, a lot of you probably use Comcast, use AT&T, Time Warner, Spectrum. I mean, the list goes on with all these different service providers. But what they most likely do is give you a single unit, a single all-in-one unit that's capable of not only wireless, but also doing your routing. Now, I bet if you look at the back of that little, you know, your ISP modem router switch, whatever you want to call it, you'll probably see that it has four ports on it. Those four ports are actually a small switch, all right? That switch allows you to connect devices, just like an access point, but these devices are hardline. Now, all these devices you connect and you plug in, they connect to something that is called your LAN, all right? LAN stands for local area network. Your local area network on most ISP modules and such is just that. It's your local network. 
All right, it's available to just you, no one else. They have to either connect to your wireless or they have to plug into your router or switch that you have available to actually be on your local area network. Now, there are some other ways around that. I don't want to get into all that technical Audi and all that stuff. This is the basics of networking, okay? So we're going to keep it basic. Now, to keep it basic, your local area network, all right, has to be able to transition out to what they call a wide area network or a WAN. So if you were to go look at the back of your ISP module, all right, or your, you know, your router, your modem, anything, whatever you're using as your router, you'll probably see that you have a WAN port, and then you have four LANs. That one WAN port is coming from your internet service provider, and that's actually what is your internet. Your other ones are your LAN, and same with your wireless. Now, what the router is actually doing is it is going and taking the data from all of the clients that are on its local area network and translating it properly so that way it can go out through its WAN network and reach out to the source that you're wanting or the destination you're wanting. Now, you're probably thinking like, whoa, that's, that's kind of crazy. It actually is how they make it do it. It breaks down into really small packets, and it, it goes over. And I'll, I'll tell you guys right now, I don't know networking that well. I, I know enough to be pretty dangerous, <laughs> I'm not going to lie, but um, I still have a lot to learn. So that's one of the main reasons I kind of want to do these videos too. So if there's anything I'm not explaining right or maybe not good enough, just go ahead, drop me down a comment below, hit me up on Twitter, let me know if I need to better explain something or I didn't understand something properly. But let me get back into the video here real quick. Sorry, <laughs> the rant over just real quick. Um, the whole point of your router is to translate your local area data to be able to put on a wide area network so you can hit the net, the internet. And that is the wide area network, is the internet. Um, your wide area network is managed by your internet service provider. They then have a job where they have routers and switches and all of that going on their side, and they're actually then routing your data from on their side, just as you are on your network. So to them, your WAN is their LAN. So it's kind of it's very kind of interesting how it all works. But there's all these giant pipelines, and there's a backbone to the internet and everything that all gets transversed and taken care of, and data is actually all transferred over that. And it's all transferred over what they call an IP address or an internet protocol address. Now, IP address has had many versions. The main one we're on right now is IPv4. A lot of you have probably heard about IPv6 coming out and being slowly pushed for and transitioned to. I'm trying to learn it, but man, is that a that is a crazy region to learn. That is, whew, that's a lot of numbers and letters and stuff. But the main thing I want to talk about is IPv4, you know, what I, internet protocol address is. What an internet protocol address does is it's a unique way of individualizing a system on a network. So whenever you have your local area network, your router is going to have an IP address. So if you were to go log into your router or if you ever were to call AT&T or Time Warner and ask them, hey, something's going on with my modem, they're probably going to ask you to, you know, log into your router and, you know, check things out. One of the ways you do that most of the time is checking what your default gateway is. So, and the reason I say checking what your default gateway is is because nine times out of ten, your router is your default gateway. And you're, the reason that is is because your default gateway on a network, on a local area network, is your way out. That the default gateway provides a way for all land sources, land clients, to get out to WAN and get out into the internet to be able to actually know what they're doing, what they're talking to. So that's exactly why you need a default gateway. That default gateway, though, needs an individual IP, and that IP is normally that of the router. Now, your computer or system you're on also needs its own IP. So it's given an IP from another service that's controlled by the router. Now, not always. In enterprise networks, there's other systems, but I'm not going to get in enterprise networks. We're going to keep it basic. If you were to get on your system, on your basic router, you would see that there is a thing called a DHCP server, all right? DHCP stands for Dynamic Host Client Protocol. And it's actually pretty cool. Um, what DHCP does is it allows systems to go ahead and connect, and then it goes ahead and it names those systems, or I should say gives those systems an IP address. All right? So what happens is, let me go ahead and actually I have some right here. So I have my DHCP server here, and that's, that's mine internally. I actually have servers that take care of DHCP in my system. Now, a lot of people have routers that do it, and that's normally how it's done in a basic network. And so what happens is that DHCP server, anytime a system connects, says, hey, this is your name on the network. Now, not only does it give it a name on a network, so it may say, hey, Xbox, this is what you're going to be called. It will also tell the Xbox, here's how many other people can possibly on the network. Here's your default gateway on how you get out into the internet. And then here are your domain name servers or your DNS servers to go ahead and be able to resolve names on the local area network. Now, that last part is what we're going to go over next. 
DNS. Now, DNS in an enterprise network, if you look over here, is usually provided by your DCs or your domain controllers. Sometimes there are DNS-specific systems that can do it. And a lot of times in smaller basic networks, such as people have, you know, ISPs, basic ISPs from home residential access, they'll be using their DNS servers. What a DNS server does is it allows us to translate an IP address to a name. So you know when you go to a URL and you're like, you know what, I want to go to google.com. When you go to google.com, it actually is going ahead and it's reaching out and actually having a pool and say, hey, who's google.com? And right now, if you notice down in the bottom left hand corner, it's resolving hosts. It's going to go ahead and actually shoot back. And from there, it's going and asking the internet, hey, who's google.com? Whenever that happens, it actually gives an IP address. Now, we don't see that because we have the browser built, but I got to show you how that works real quick. If you actually were to open up a command prompt on Windows, let me go ahead and bring it over, and we were to ping google.com, look at that. It resolves back to an IP address. All right? That's how DNS works. DNS allows you to resolve a name to an IP address. And why that's important is that for enterprise networks, such as businesses and companies that are, have large scale networks, DNS is a great way to resolve issues instead of having to say, here, hit this IP address. Say you have a system that's constantly moving, or say you have a system that has multiple IP addresses, instead of saying, hey, hit this IP address or hit all these different IP addresses, you can tell the network, I want you to hit this one name. And what will happen is it'll hit that one name and try to resolve the different IP addresses allocated to that name based on what's in your domain name server. So to bring it all together, guys, and I know I've been on a rant for a little bit, your router provides DHCP, Dynamic Host Client Protocol, which will give individual IP addresses or basically kind of a unique name to systems on the network. It will give out a subnet address. A subnet is how many people can be on this network. What's the total size of it? All right. Now, the basic size is 254, and I'll go over subnets and things like that later, but to give you an idea, that's just the basic. So basic size is 254 clients on a network. It also will give you your default gateway. Your default gateway is what allows you to get out into the internet and how things you know, are accessible. And it will also give you normally your primary and secondary domain name servers. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead real quick and I'm gonna open up my network and sharing. Let me get change my adapter settings. So if we actually bring this up, let me bring up the right one, guys. Actually, you know what? We can bring that one up. Oh. So if we actually bring this one up, let me bring up its status so you guys can see its details. So as I was saying, right here, these are the things it gives you. Now, mine I have set up for four domain name servers, but these are what I was talking about. So anytime you connect to a local network, all right, you're connecting to a basic network, you're over to a friend's house, you guys connecting your Xboxes, just remember, your Xbox is having to do a lot of things really fast for you. It's having to reach out, it's having to get a unique name, all right, from a DHCP server, which then your router's having to give it. On top of that, then, once it gets all that information, it has to go through and verify by connecting over to Microsoft and some other places saying, hey, am I on the internet? Am I good to go? Once it does that, then you're actually able to connect and play online. So there's a lot that happens in those few you know, milliseconds. A lot of people are like, why is it working? Why is it taking so long? There's a lot of little things that go on whenever you connect to the network. It's, it's kind of crazy. I plan to go over, you know, VLANs and switches and uh, DHCPs. I plan on going over the OSI model, DNS, and covering that all more in depth in each individual videos. And the main reason is, is I want to get more into virtualization. I want to go over vSwitching and such. If you notice here, I do have a lot of vSwitches, different VLANs and such that all ride. And I, that's one of the things that I want to go over is how to set this all up, how to manage your vSwitching, how to manage your LAN, how to manage your VLANs, and, you know, your bandwidth and your, you know, your networking side infrastructure. Because not only, you know, when you run a nice home lab, or you run an enterprise environment or you're trying to just run a nice home network that you don't want to have all this clog congestion you want you know maximum bandwidth that's some of the things i want to go over to make sure everybody kind of understands what they're getting themselves into so i hope that this video kind of helped outline you know the basics of the networks and what you need to know go ahead and drop down you know down below comment if i didn't go over anything right if maybe i was too confusing i talked too fast you know i do a lot of that so Hoping I get better, guys. If there's anything you want me to go over, if there's anything you want to know about me, drop me a line. Feel free to subscribe. And uh, as always, I'll see you guys in the lab.